Hi, everyone. Um, it's me again. <laughs> uh, you can call me Zay. Um, so I'm going to be moderating the next panel. Um, I'm, like I mentioned in the very beginning, I'm an artist, a cultural worker. I'm also a co-director of SOPC. I'm going to hold this mic because I don't want to <laughs> want to lean into it. But um, so for this next session, I'm joined by three esteemed panelists. We have Lin Yun, Rachel Ua, and Ayana Cotton. And so the three of these folks are all alum of the School for Predict Computation, and they've also gone on to steward their own educational environments. And so for this panel, we'll be having the presenters present for a few minutes about themselves and about their projects, and then after they present, I'll be moderating a conversation between the four of us. And so before actually passing it off to the panelists, I'd like to actually read an excerpt from the introduction of the third Software for Artists Day book in order to help ground the presentations that you're about to witness today. And so I will start just reading. During seasonal admissions periods at our school, we often make a reference to the quote-unquote special sauce of SFPC, an unspoken quality of our community that is continually reignited and reaffirmed during the start of every new session. The special sauce is what makes SFPC feel the way that it does. The realities that many of us want to live in and thrive in rely on our special sauce fractalizing beyond SFPC. And so SFPC alum, type designer and educator, Lin Yun, who is one of our panelists today, describes a dream of overlapping community ecosystems, paving the way for future endeavors to flourish and sustain themselves more easily. Lynn said, quote, people often struggle with the idea of starting something new because the first time doing something is difficult. But hopefully, the next time another person wants to start something new, it'll be easier. Maybe in some years, we can sit back and just enjoy all the lovely communities that have sprung up around us, unquote. And so years from now, we intend to do just that. While we reflect on the years of the School for Product Computation, before this moment, its founding and its namesake, a massive upheaval and the hurdles of a new era, we also look towards the next 10 years. Our vision of a beautiful school is also one of many beautiful schools. We yearn to see networks and practice of the imminent and the otherworldly softly cascading into one another, collectively leveraging the tools we have access to in order to sustainably mobilize together. And with that, I'd like to pass it off to our three panelists. And so we'll start with Lynn, and then move to Rachel, and then end with Ayana. Thank y'all. Thank you very much. Just one second, please. Um, oops, sorry. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much to SFPC, Zay, Pioneerworks for having us. My name is Lin Yoon, and I run the Space Hype Studio with my studio partner, Kevin Ye, who you might have met over there in the back because we're also tabling. Um, and I also run a school called Type Electives with my co-director, Juan Villanueva. And I'll talk briefly about the aspects that inform my practice and how it all fits into running a school because they're not separate things in my mind, right? It's not like I make my craft, I do different kinds of crafts from like Monday through Wednesday and then like the rest of the week I'm running a school, right? Um, so the two driving forces in my practice is the love that I have for my craft and community. First of all, running the studio space type forms the backbone of the craft side of my practice. And this is where I bring in my skills as a type designer, calligrapher, and my partner Kevin brings in his skills as a full stack, full stack developer. And we're both educating and doing a lot of work related to creative technology. The studio practice centers on pretty much everything related to the art and craft of letter forms, uh, such as 
typefaces, meaning that I explain that I design fonts if I meet someone random at a house party. I also do calligraphy, which is the art of writing. I make physical things. I also paint murals that might be really large. This says, which means you are not alone in Korean. Uh, this is at the seaport if you have been around the Tim building. And of course, uh, you might have seen our table in the back where we print a lot of small fun things. But most of all, I wanted to uh, plug SFPC in general here, and I'm sure that's why you're all here. But my love for computation really started when I attended SFPC in 2018. I attended the Code Society's summer program with Melanie Hoff and Taeyun Choi, amongst other wonderful faculty then. And then right after, I was also fortunate to attend the 10-week um, residency in the fall right after, learning from more wonderful teachers such as Lauren Gardner, Zach Lieberman, and who you just saw on stage, American artist, Seiwei and Taylor of CWNT, and also Sam Levine, who is also uh, tabling in the back as well. Um, and I also can't thank my very wonderful cohort enough, many of whom are here. Again, there's just so much love and, pa and just a collective commitment to care and criticality. And I think that experience is fundamental that shapes uh, the school that I decided to start later on. And just really my entire practice. And so the other half of uh, my practice is focused on community with love and care as the basis. I'm heavily involved in organizing, teaching, collaborating, and also learning because that's all uh, what it really comes down to at the core too. I'm always learning to do these things, learning from other people, learning how to craft a community uh, together going forward. And so one aspect uh, as it relates to community is the accessibility of niche expertise that I've accumulated over the years. So I've been formally teaching since 2016, uh, which is pretty much right after I became a professional type designer. But I wanted to plug in that like, an, like a field like type design was so niche when I started learning it back maybe it was only about like a decade ago, but there was only one school only in the form of continuing education that was teaching type design that was in New York City. And so I had to, felt like I had to jump through so many hoops to get there. Um, and it shouldn't be like that, right? Like for anyone who wants to learn, it should be accessible. And so uh, at the core of my practice is trying to make sure the, the expertise that I have accumulated isn't gate kept any longer. And so, I have done uh, projects such as uh, this Foundations of Type Design course, uh, which is at uh, typedesignschool.com. It was crowdfunded in 2020. It contains about maybe 10 plus hours of recorded lectures that I would teach over like one entire 15 week semester at an institution's like the new school, right? Um, this idea translates to other courses that aren't strictly type design as well. For example, uh, Kevin and I have taught this class on generative typography. It's usually about 10 weeks. And all our syllabi, the assignments, the lectures, they're all on GitHub, free for anyone to see. And this goes for any of our shorter workshops as well. The most recent big adventure I've embarked on is type electives. And this is an online design school that has become a huge part of my practice. And this school I co-founded with Juan Villanueva, who is a very dear friend of mine and also a colleague. And this started because we were teaching for so many institutions, SVA, Parsons, the New School, the Cooper Union, um, and we were on boards for big design organizations like the TDC, AAJ New York, Society of Scribes. And it felt like we really, it felt like we had to jump through so many hoops to enable scholarships, to enable programming that was accessible because there were so many red tapes that we had to get through. And at a certain point, we started thinking, well, do we really need these organizations to give us spaces? What if we just started something of our own and started, accumul started uh, from scratch um, to do what we wanted to do and to consolidate our efforts into something more than it was just one-off events that was happening here and there. And so type electives came together. 
And our mission is to form a more inclusive and equitable future in type and design by, by increasing accessibility to all these special uh, niche fields. And we want to really create a thoughtful space to shape the discourse around type as culture and industry. And our faculty is made up of a diverse community of people who approach their practice from a place of respect, responsibility, criticality, and love. And you'll notice that there's a lot of overlap between the SFPC community and the folks that you see here. Um, and, I, and I think I also saw Megna in the crowd earlier too. And uh, scholarships are a huge part of the school. It is really the reason why we have the school in the first place, because we wanted to give accessible education to folks. And so giving out scholarships to black, indigenous, and folks of color is a big part of our efforts for access parity. And I'm really proud to say that so far, we, are in our, we just wrapped up our third semester. We have run 16 classes, and we've given out 74 individual scholarships. And <laughs> thank you. Yeah. The scholarship awards range from a quarter to full tuition. Uh, the, the, um, so it, it depends like which area folks are coming from, what their background, what walks of life they're in, of course. Um, and we're really proud to say that the median award is about 72% of the tuition, which is quite high. And we initially started type electives thinking that we'd be really, really lucky not to end up um, going bankrupt. But we're just so thankful that we were able to give out um, it's about third, a little bit over $31,000 this year in terms of tuition. And so far, the majority of scholarships have been funded by a lot of donations, small and large, and we're just so incredibly grateful. And although we initially started out as an online design school, as we started uh, really getting up and getting the school going, we started getting venues donated by like-minded people. So these are just some images from the free workshops that we have started to run around the city. They're always uh, free or uh, donation-based. And it can be from a small coffee shop like this uh, that has a lot of different people. This is uh, for a death metal lettering workshop that we ran. Like, it's, you know, 60 plus people in a small little coffee shop, but a lot of energy with no AC. This is summer. <laughs> Um, and then we've also hosted, um, you know, big events with you know, 150 plus people as well. It's all very much a new venture. Of course, like teaching, organizing events, um, do, doing a lot of these things aren't new to myself and Juan, but doing something under our own school is a whole new adventure of its own. And we're always getting so much help from the community and we're just so thankful for all the faculty, the volunteers, the students uh, that really come together to uh, make the school, you know, be what it is. And so we're excited about going into 2024 in that spot. And so that's how the craft and community pillars come together. And I'm really looking forward to our panel discussion. All right, thank you. It's, okay, it's working. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Rachel Ua, and uh, I just came from Berlin on Thursday, so I'm a little bit jet lagged and. <laughs> I don't know what's happening in my brain, so just uh, bear with me. Um, I was also, like Tiga had mentioned, I was also in the, lucky enough to be in the first class of SFPC in 2013. And um, yeah, it was amazing. I um, Definitely a pivotal moment in my life. Uh, so what we were asked to talk about what makes a school. So um, I think a school is who we are. Um, and I guess I will be getting into this. I do wanted, I wanted to give credit to these other um, independent schools that I've worked with in the past. So I used to work in audio engineering for many years and then the US started bombing Iraq in 2003. And then essentially, you know, people were like, love it or leave it. And I was like, okay, bye. And so I left the US, I left my career uh, in audio and eventually I had to do something else. So I found this online school, FX PhD, where you can learn how to do visual effects. And it was created by three guys who were like, we need people who are, have better skills. And so 
back to the uh, school is who we are, it's like they were visual effects professionals and they were like, we see this need for education in this field. And so I took that class, I took the, the school, I went, I attended the school for like a year and I worked in visual effects for a couple of years. And um, yeah, I feel like that was kind of like my jump into alternative education that's not at an institution. And, um, but eventually, of course, I left visual effects because it's fucking exhausting. I don't know if you've worked in the film industry, but it's, uh, it's exhausting. So, um, and, and at the time, actually, people were starting to do a lot of interactive technology stuff and kind of like, you know, minority report with like touch screen and all those kind of things. So I thought, okay, I just want to learn to do this in the real world instead of in the computer. And so I stopped working and I started taking like every coding class I could find. At the time I wasn't, I didn't really know what it was. I was just taking like every language to try to learn everything. And eventually this school that uh, was based in Berlin, Open Tech School, they were like, you're at every single event. Uh, would you like to be on the organizing committee? And of course I was super excited about that. And so uh, that was an open source school and actually it still exists today. And um, and I think actually at some point I realized like, okay, I, I think, so their point was they were a bunch of developers and they wanted to see more diversity in, in the tech field and specifically in programming. And, um, and at some point I realized that, I mean, at first I wanted to see diversity as well, of course, but then I was like, actually I care more about what people do with technology as opposed to that they're just, you know, learning how to use it. So I kind of started from there, the creative code tech wing of Open Tech School at the time. And today it still exists, but it kind of uh, became its own thing. So now it's Creative Code Berlin. And uh, from that time too, there was like, you know, Creative Code Budapest and then Creative Code Amsterdam and Utrecht. So it's kind of also a, a format that has expanded. And then at some point I was like, oh yeah. And so then also we, we started a hacker school as well called Hackership the same core group of Open Tech School. I think they wanted to explore, or we wanted to explore in general, um, different finance formats for what uh, learning to code could be. And, um, and so anyway, so after being a part of all of these uh, organizations and organizing things, I was like, I really want to create things. I don't want to just organize. So I ended up attending um, ITP Camp. ITP Camp, I don't know if people, ITP Camp is awesome. Hi, Carrie. <laughs> okay, and, um, and so that was amazing. And there were several people also from Europe and we were all like, oh my God, we should bring this to Europe. This is amazing. And so we started a Google Doc and um, people were, I mean, eventually it was just me on the Google Doc. And then I was like, okay, well, right at the moment that I realized I was the only one, you know, contributing to it, um, I was accepted into the first class of SFPC. And I think actually that the main takeaway that I have, or of course there's like many takeaways, but only have a few minutes. So, um, but I think one of the things was, it's kind of like reference in the first talk, which is like how to um, feel comfortable not knowing something and knowing that you will be able to learn eventually. So I feel like that was kind of this um, amazing, I don't know, feeling of warmth and safety that I learned from SFPC, which is like, you know, there's always a way to learn about the technology. You just have to believe that you can do it. So, um, so then after SFPC, I immediately went back to Berlin and I started School of Machines, Making and Make Believe. And um, the idea was, well, so basically, uh, I, a school is supposed to reflect who you are. And so at this point, you know, I had been working in audio, there were no women, I worked in visual effects, there were no women. So that was definitely an important aspect of things. How do you get more women into technology? And of course at the time it was still like, people were like, oh, women just aren't interested in technology. And it's like, well, obviously that was bullshit, you know, because I'm interested in technology. I know other people are. So I think here I just will, will mention really quickly this one quote from, uh, it was a most deaf song. Uh, and basically he says, you want to know what's going on with hip hop? What's going on with you? That's what's going on with hip hop. And so from that moment, I was like, okay, what's go like when I worked in audio, I was like, what's going on with audio? What's going on with me? That's what's going on with audio. Or like when I'm working in creative technology, oh, what's going on with me? That's what's going on with creative technology. And so I very much feel the personal also belongs inside of every space that we go into. Um, so I started off the school with two classes, uh, two four-week full-time classes in the summer. One was focused more on creative coding and the other one on physical computing. And um, 
I have a lot of interesting survival stories for that, but I don't have a lot of time, so I'm happy to talk about things after. The next year, I basically um, you know, increased the number of classes that I did, and I think basically the thing was that I always wanted to be thinking about a space and who the people are. So for example, I, um, I wanted to do a class in Serbia because there was this really cool festival called Resonate there, and I thought, okay, if I'm gonna do a class in Serbia, I want to reflect the people and the people that are going on there, the history, and so I designed this class called Fabricating Empathy. Uh, to think about, um, I mean, in general, I want people to think about who they are and what they care about and to put that into their work. And so that followed along the lines of, of this belief. I did want to show this just because, so originally when I started School of Machines, it was like art, technology, and design school. But then at some point, I was like, you know, there was this feeling where I realized, like, I think I can put who I am into this, and that meant human connection. And so I was, I found the part, you know, the place on GitHub, it was like March 2016 or something, where I was, you know, I was really debating, like, can I put, you know, art technology design human connection? Like, is it too cheesy? I don't know. And I was like, okay, I'm going to do it, you know, and I, and I pushed it onto GitHub, and like, ever since then, I felt like, I don't know, it was the right thing, and it is, it is definitely who I, who I am. So uh, I guess another thing to mention, I'm, I don't, sorry, I don't know how much time I have, but, um, but basically, you know, because I'm not tied to any one technology, I've run classes on every kind of technology that seems interesting in the moment. So we've done computer vision, of course, virtual reality, augmented reality, working with data, working with drones, et cetera. So every, I think there's, there's and, and basically my premise is like, I want to use technology to get people to think about who they are and what they care about. And so, um, random, yeah, a bunch of random images from school. Um, I think one of the things I wanted to talk about was, um, so basically I got to this point where uh, I, you know, I see a lot of people who are interested in these things, but they don't necessarily have the confidence. And I feel like one of the things I've realized is like, we all need to share who we are in a deeper way with each other. And so one of the things we do in the first class, I'm looking at you, Malika, you're just in this class in the summer. And the thing that I find most effective is that like on the first day, well, one of the things is that we make pancakes together. I think there's a picture of pancakes here. And so, you know, it's like an informal way to get to know each other. We're all cooking together. And, um, but then we sit together, we go to a parker, we kind of sit together and we talk about who we are and what our life experiences are and what the fuck is going on in the world and how can it be different and how can it be better. And um, I feel like giving people the space to really share all of the deep things that have troubled them until that point is so important and sets the ground for like how we're going to treat each other for the time we have together. So I think, you know, I've been, I've been doing a fellowship at a university in the Netherlands, and this is kind of one of the things that I've really been pushing for, and I think we've all seen the benefits of how deep somebody can go when they're given the free space to be who they are. And to say, you know, like, I think one of the things, I, I didn't mention this at the beginning, you know, uh, I've been ori I'm originally from Texas, and um, Texas is horrible, horrible politically, among other things. I don't know if you all know, but I think everybody knows this point. But um, but aside from that, you know, and then and most of my family are from Mexico, so and there's a lot of racism there, of course, and also I came from a very abusive home, and kind of the way that I dealt with that was trying to help other people. So then I would go and like volunteer at a homeless shelter or volunteer at an AIDS hospice, and then you know because of journalism, I feel like my journalism class basically saved me, and so I could write about these experiences, and so all of these things, all of this care and giving a fuck and questioning authority, all are about what the school is about and um, yeah I mean I don't have like an official like you know uh, what statement but it's like this be who we fucking are and so um, just a, a quick note that like aside from School of Machines the thing that I really want to do next is School of Humans because you know as I've been using technology to get people to think about who they are at the same time technology isn't fucking everywhere in everything and we shouldn't be referencing it at every fucking moment Sorry I'm cursing, it's probably the tiredness. But anyway, uh, so uh, this is the next thing that I'm pivoting towards and I hope more people will start to work and, and contribute to School of Machines at the same time that I can pivot over here and start to focus on School of Humans. I think a lot of the things that I think about are like, 
you know, the things that we didn't get taught about when we were, when we were children or when, a, any time, you know, like how to communicate, how to think about and, and realize that we matter, who we are matters, and therefore who other people are also matters, and how to talk about all of the difficult things that were being gaslit from, like, the government on down to parents and, and like, everywhere. And so um, I feel like School of Humans will be kind of... Um, I don't know, a generous space for us to, uh, to be real with each other. So some last thoughts. Uh, what makes a school? Again, I think a school is who we are. Um, for anyone thinking about making a school, I think it's important to really know who you're making a school for. So that's kind of like one of the main things. Um, I would say don't get into making a school for the money because there's no fucking money. So like you will be sad uh, pretty quickly and frustrated. Um, don't make a school to be cool, fuck cool, be real. I feel like I've met several people in my life, I mean, in the last years, who are like telling me all about their school that they're gonna start and, and it never happens. And I think it's because you have to fucking believe in it and you, ha you know, because you have to give everything. You have to give everything. And so you really need the belief in this, you know, the hardcore belief in yourself and what you're doing and why you're doing it. As humans, we experience the joys and tragedies of life and then we see a need, something missing, and a school is born. A school is who we are. Who are you? Thank you. Oh. Hey, y'all. Hi, it's so cool seeing so many friends here. Um, I've been telling folks, I feel like so many of us, we have like this intellectual intimacy that's happening. We, we know each other online and very rarely, at least in my case, get to see each other in person. So I'm excited to be here. Um, and I don't know how to enter into learning spaces without first grounding our sensorium, so I'm going to invite you to do the same. I'm gonna invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath with me and really maybe mentally note something you can see, hear, feel, um, smell, touch. Uh, if you are inside of CETA School, this practice is very familiar to you, so I'm gonna invite you into it now. I'm feeling my heart beating. I'm feeling the beautiful jazz of the art fair in the background. And um, I'm also going to invite you to share with your neighbor if you feel comfortable. Uh, one of my first learning spaces was like the, these like Southern Baptist churches. So uh, share with your neighbor if you feel comfortable what's going on. Yay. All right, y'all. I love that we actually did that. <laughs> uh, so if you are also inside a CETA school, you know I am the person who basically just puts their speaker notes on the slides because it helps me to read along um, when I'm in learning spaces, but it also helps me to keep to time because I can't, we ain't going, I wouldn't be able to do this in seven minutes without the text. So, uh, CETA School started as a speculative fiction parallel universe uh, called Psychofa. We know this place as the North Carolina Black River and they know it as Psychofa, a parallel universe suspended among the past and the future where cornrows are cryptography keys, data farms are data forests, the weaving loom is a computer, and encoded cotton cloth is a document. And this is me rocking some um, Psychofa rolls in the corner. Uh, down here. Uh, so, chain link fencing in this place, chain link fencing from demolished prisons are used as architectural membrane woven with plant life inside Kofa. The trees have learned to communicate using the data Psychophians have encoded 
in the DNA of the Denjo databases made up of ancient tree rings. So this story was really inspired um, by the research of Grow Your Own Cloud, these folks who are literally right this second um, encoding data into the DNA of plants. Uh, through their research, I remembered that we can store data into the DNA of plants and read from a tree's memory through dendrochronology. From there, I developed psychopha narration as a software uh, and multi-author storytelling technology for nonlinear narration. Um, I did this at Ginkgo Bioworks Creative Residency, and really that's when um, the story emerged as well. So the story uses psychopha narration, right? That, that software that I developed while in residency at Ginkgo um, to tell the story of an ancient abolitionist future through the Phil Jerner entries of a non-binary -bi biotechnologist named Sita, uh, and the found data within an ancient 2,600-year-old Bart Cypress tree named Sai. So why North Carolina? I found out that one of the oldest living trees on the East Coast is on North Carolina's Black River. And I started to speculate, what has this tree seen, right? What does this tree know? Uh, and I used that speculation as a framework for writing a story where instead of smushing all of my citations in, in to the back of the book or putting all my footnotes in the bottom of the page, what would it look like to develop a software in a database where I put all of my citations in the database and I wrote with my citations. I algorithmically wove this story with the references that are informing my embodied experience. Uh, so our narrator is a bald cypress tree, but also a portal. Um, so the, the narration, uh, the, the, the algorithmically generated narration is the voice of Psy. Uh, the people of Psychofa have traditionally hosted their data within the DNA of their trees. But what happens when Sita discovers a rip in the dendrochronological, dendrochronological memory exposing select data sets from our world to theirs? So there's two main characters. There's Sita and then there's Sai, who is like my algorithmically generated uh, narrative of resources and collective imagination. And then Sita is this other character, right? And what happens when this character from like this, this abolitionist future, this, this ancient past, exposes and like starts to get some, starts to see some data from our world. Uh, what then emerges? And from that speculation, a school emerged. So this is our mission. And I love what Camila was talking about earlier, right? Like, let's be super clear about what our mission and our values are, because uh, I really do believe that's what makes a school. So the CETA school mission is to empower communities of interdisciplinary artists making revolution irresistible through world building. And here I am always, always, always invoking Tony K. Bambara. Uh, the vision. So I completely got like this text, a lot of this text uh, from the School of Poetic Computation and their community agreements that has inspired so much of my practice. But the vision is an ecosystem of abundantly resourced creative practices of queer, trans, black, indigenous people of color, disabled, gender non-conforming, low income survivals, and all other oppressed people so that we may imagine and build the worlds we need and desire in the present through collective divestment. So CETA School started as a school teaching coding through a black feminist lens. Uh, I had this experience uh, where I learned how to code, and then I was teaching coding, but it was, comp it, but then I also had this like, I also had this black feminist research practice that was happening and the two were completely separate. And I was like, what happens when we teach coding through a black feminist lens? How do I combine both of those things? So that's when the school emerged, but more recently, um, the current offering inside of CETA school is um, a, a retreat, a nine week retreat where I walk through how we can start to generate income inside of our creative practices. I am completely unsatisfied with the only like three ways that we can survive as artists being like through the university, um, through a whole bunch of like collaging artist grants um, and selling work, right? Like that, that those can't be the only three, the, that, those can't be the only three ways. Um, so what would it look like for us to, uh, 
create our own businesses that are inspired and deeply connected to our art practices so that when there is a genocide happening, we can say something about it, right? So when there um, is something that does not align with our values that happen in the places that we work, we can choose to divest, right? And our survival not be threatened. So that's the current um, offering inside of CETA School. And it looks like uh, the text is a little uh, overlapping here, but these are some of our values. This is kind of like the organizing framework of the school. And uh, if y'all ever see me in misalignment with these values, I invite you to pull me in, call me out, all of the above. So we're not interested in diversity, equity, and inclusion agendas that uphold the status quo. We're interested in a fundamental reimagining and transformation of power distribution. We remember black feminism is a politic, not a demographic. We center black feminist values as seed data and or soil to root the worlds we're building inside of. We invite generative conflict and prioritize emergent fractal collective authorship in order to adapt out of, right? We be unlearning, we, we are unlearning exactly, um, just kind of echoing what Camila said in the previous panel, uh, in order to adapt out of learned impulses favoring individualism, hierarchy, competition, neoliberalism, co colon, um, colon, colonialism, uh, and white supremacist capitalist patriarchal ways of working. This is coming from Bell Hooks. Uh, we are spirit led, y'all. All right, I'm gonna say that again. <laughs> we are spirit led and we are centering our spirit, right? We work in alignment with the pace of our bodies in the seasons, right? So if our bodies are in the room, so is the need for consistent rest, ease, joy, care, time and space to grieve. Also, we are committed to the ancestral practice of remembering the past to build a future that prioritizes life. We build to honor and remember the people we've never met, dead and not born. So while this is a new school, uh, it did not come from nowhere, right? It came from deep prayer and communion with my ancestors and uh, so many of the liberatory uh, frameworks of, of pedagogy and schools that came before CETA school. Uh, we also refuse techno-determinism, right? We acknowledge the digital tools containing Colton that we use every day have the blood of violent globalization embedded into them. We remember the future we need may have absolutely nothing to do with 21st century software and hardware. And um, I feel like this sentiment is echoed inside of SF, SFPC as well. So the last, last, last value that I wanted to share with y'all is around uh, remembering decolonial futures require interdisciplinary practice. Right? Whatever world we are building, if it is about liberation, we gonna have to practice some interdisciplinary being. Uh, we prioritize unlearning colonial conceptions of human being while learning from indigenous ways of being as we imagine and rehearse new worlds together. So I talk about all of this and more at my Substack. If you want to uh, continue to like, Think with me, think alongside me, and engage in collective study with me and the folks inside of CETA School. I want to invite you to subscribe to the newsletter. And this is also where I'll be announcing the next uh, cohort in the next round of the CETA World Retreat. Thank you all so much. Can you hear me? Yeah, you can, okay. Cool, thank you all for sharing your presentations with us today. It's really amazing seeing the just sort of diverse approaches that you've each taken, especially um, just even just sharing a background being alums at SFPC. Um, and so I'd love to begin by just sort of delving into the lived experiences that have brought you all here today. Um, you've each named uh, your relationship with past institutions um, that have really sort of shaped your journey into creating your own initiatives. And something that I'm really curious about is, um, based on those experiences, um, I would love to hear from each of you about 
what sort of elements from traditional institutions are you um, choosing to retain? And then conversely, what elements are you intentionally choosing to leave behind? Um, and maybe another way to kind of think about this is um, where are you choosing to invest your energy and resources and where are you thinking about intentionally divesting away from um, in order to fulfill the visions that you have for your school? Uh, would you like to start, Lynn? <laughs> Maybe uh, you could grab the... Okay. Oh, okay. great. Oh, amazing, it's working. Um, so yes, so that's a great question. Thank you so much. I started my career sort of... My, let me rephrase. I started my teaching career as what you would call the traditional like path where I was an unpaid teaching assistant for many semesters, which then turned into me getting substitute assignments, right, being the substitute teacher, and then therefore, and then after that, getting my own classes. Um, I think in a traditional environment, there is the advantage where students are expected to show up with a certain, in a certain space, uh, in a certain environment, and I think that expectation is something that all of us uh, are, just have, just by the nature of all of us, like, as little kids, like, going through school, like, going through institutions, like, you know, going through middle, high school, and all of these uh, primary forms of education, I think the part where it is necessary to walk away from it is where it gets in the way of equity. Uh, at least it is for me. Um, for example, I was doing fundraising for a scholarship, and institutions were telling me that we could not spend the scholarship on just folks of color, because that would go against certain um, institutional obligations that they had to the state or whatever. Um, and I think that's like the part where like it's hard for me to imagine that as a community that we just can't come together and help the people in the community that we want to help. So I think that's where like I had to break away from that system because it feels like we're all together in this room and if we want to help out somebody in here, we should be able to without having to worry about if this is going to break some rule that a, 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 an unseen entity or like the shape, you know, or just has. Sorry, that was a rambling, but I hope it came across. Uh, testing, okay, it's very good. It's like Zoom, it's like, can you hear me? <laughs> um, I guess the thing is, like, so I went to university for seven years and I never graduated in the end. I needed like two credits, math and English, and I had three jobs already in the field that I was studying. So then I was like, well, I'll just be one of these people who can succeed without the degree. And for the most part, I think it has, has played out well. Um, I think the thing is I never wanted to be an academic because um, ac I feel like there's this kind of elitism that happens and like the words that people use are there for each other but not for people to actually understand what you're saying. And so it's, it's very um, gate kept. And, um, and I think if an idea is so important, then we need everybody to understand. So, so I, I have, for the most part, just rejected um, the kind of institution of university. I mean, right now I am doing a fellowship, but the fellowship what is about learning how people learn. And it's bringing my methodology into a university system and seeing how those two things might go together. Perhaps in the end they won't. I have no idea if they will really um, take my evaluation seriously. But, um, but yeah, so uh, I think I, you know, and also I, I remember recently, I, especially with, um, you know, there's like the whole student loan thing going on and basically it's fucking insane that people pay so much fucking money for university and it's shocking that people just go through it because I guess the network is like somehow worth it or something, but like don't buy into the lie that you need to pay that much money to be somebody in the world. I mean, it's like, I don't know. I just really, I, I think, you know, especially around COVID time, I was just thinking everybody, like all of these university professors that are kind of being let go, you should all start your own schools, you know, start your own schools based on who you are and create that space because I hope, I hope, I think it's coming true, but I it feel like the university system is dying and I hope it's true. <laughs> yeah, and before we get to you, Ayan, I think I'm gonna just pivot to a different sort of um, thought stream in that 
Um, I think something that strikes me as a connective tissue between all of your projects is this question of scale, um, this question of uh, prototypicality, um, and none of these initiatives, as I understand them, are really aiming to sort of operate at the same scale as some of these larger institutions, just in terms of um, like size or like mass reach. And so um, this sort of idea of like building against the scale of empire is this intentional effort, you know, that also allows a certain level of improvisation. Um, and I'm sort of curious um, to hear from all of you, or like actually, I'll ask just to, just to Yana for time, but um, I'm curious about what other um, unique advantages you sort of find with working at a smaller scale um, and the ways in which you consider your school to be a prototype. Oh, that's a really delicious question. <laughs> um, well, I think the advantages definitely get to what uh, the previous conversation was about around this idea of refusing standardization, right? Like we, you can, like you said, move, you can be more nimble. And uh, I've been thinking a lot about fractals this week in preparation um, for this day and this talk. And I feel like something that we talk about in CETA school is like, do you wanna have like this, this deep institutional impact where you are essentially like going into the rooms of power and being able to shift the resources around and really being able to um, play at that scale of empire, but just being a black person doing it, right? Or a person of color doing it. Like, is that what you wanna do? Or do we wanna have this like fractal impact where like us give, sharing this syllabus or us teaching this person, they then go to their communities and teach it. Um, they then go to their neighborhoods. They, they then go to their public libraries. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm much more interested in that because then we start to really be able to embed our local ecosystems into our ways of working. Uh, we start to have conversations that are inspired and woven with, right, the candy lady, the, the, the forest, the river, like we, we can start to think alongside folks in ways um, that don't require standardization and categor categorization um, and colonial ways of uh, sharing information. It can be way, way, way more wild uh, when our syllabus is like just for this block, you know, or when our when our um, when our teaching programs are um, just for this specific group of people, and then they go then find their specific group of people. Yeah, um, yeah, I think working at a smaller scale really affords a sense of specificity. Um, it really allows us to move away from just different false notions of like universality that you see in um, these like higher institutions. Um, and I think something that I appreciate about all of you is that you're sort of moving within a different ethic, um, something you're moving in a way that recognizes that specificity does not necessitate marginalization. Like y'all can all be like, okay, this is what I need and I'm gonna invite you to study with me based on what I need um, and we can all do that. You know, we can all sort of like dream up these little microcosms of worlds that are based on our specific needs, um, maybe what, we're, what we feel is lacking from our experiences and um, you know, that doesn't, that's okay. And we don't have to, we can have like those little centers for everyone. Um, and I think, it, yeah, it's making me think that with these different levels of scale also sort of mean different uh, definitions of success. And I just want to ask Lynn, um, how are you thinking about, like at the smaller scale as well, like how do you think about um, like success and fulfillment in, in your work? Like in terms of school or yeah, just? Yeah, like how do you, like, how, like in what way do you feel fulfilled at type electives in a way that might think about success outside mm. of? Like maybe yeah. I've reached so many people yeah. or different sort of traditional notions of success. Yeah. Um, this is where my co-founder Juan Villanueva and I have different ideas uh, where for me, I think if just like the fractal idea that we were talking about, if I can inspire a smaller group of people who will then do their own thing and I don't need to be in that spot of being the organizer, being the teacher, I would be very happy. Um, I 
I teach and I organize and I do all these things and I love doing them, but at the same time, I really prefer to be behind the scenes. I don't really like being the person of somewhat authority in front of the classroom, but I'm, I'm there because I'm I was just so tired of complaining about accessibility and all of these things and nobody else will do it for me. And so I just had to be the person that like, all right, we're gonna start this. And like, whereas like Juan is a little bit more like, okay, we need to think about how we're going to keep on doing this for the foreseeable future forever, right? And I think that's a good, that's a good middle point, right? Where like I gauge success in smaller ways. Uh, Juan wants uh, it to be a larger thing that can change the, uh, the, the fucked up system that we're in. Um, and I think that dynamic is where I think we find success in. Thank you for that. Um, so we're gonna end this conversation now and I think to close out, um, I would love to end by evoking an analogy from one of my favorite writers, um, Alexis Pauline Gums. Um, she has a book named Undrowned, um, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals. Um, and, and so in this book, she's um, playing different examples of really what we can learn from um, marine life and what we as humans can learn. And, um, an example that really stuck out to me was she was describing this society of striped dolphins, which are called schools, and um, she was noting that at any given time, you only see a third of the dolphins on the surface, and um, she goes on to sort of ask, like, what sense of scale and what sense of trust is needed to allow some of us to fall back and allow some of us to step into like more prevalent roles. Um, and I think that's something that's also just really interesting in sort of thinking about, um, you know, there's like an abundance that exists that can let some of us step back at certain times. Like it's really cyclical and it's okay to sort of distribute that across. Um, and I think, especially in thinking about learning environments, I think about that to what you're saying, Lynn, just in the sense of um, just different roles that we can occupy in educational environments that really allow us to step outside of um, just traditional hierarchies in learning environments. And I will end there. Um, thank you all. <laughs> I think we're gonna, yeah, Todd thank might you. be coming up to say something, but I think we're gonna have our intermission with workshops and music soon. Shout out Kia. <laughs>